friends, I'm not sure I could craft the right words to say how I feel about being with you all here today. Words are a rather limited tool when it comes to matters of the heart. But at the very least, Amanda and William and Eliza and I are, are thrilled to be here. The beginning of a new chapter for us all. It's tremendously humbling and even a little terrifying. What if I say the wrong thing? What if I am not there for you when you need me most? What if I can't live up to the hope that you have for me? For any and all of these things, forgive me and please pray for me, a sinner. Well, next Sunday, I'm going to share with you the one homily I will ever preach. They say, us preachers, you know, we only really have one homily. And next week, I'm going to give it to you full out. I thought I would save it, you know, not have all the fireworks on my first Sunday. So today will be a little bit of a warm-up, if that's okay with you. Well, some uh, nine or ten years ago, I, I shared God's Word with you here as a student invited by Canon Pat. And I think I may have told this actual story, actually I heard it from my dad, uh, possibly inspired by this, this divine ascent, the ladder of divine ascent here to the pulpit. But I feel it's worth sharing again on this auspicious occasion. Well, you may have actually heard the story, whether from me or not, but there was a, a couple of years ago a jogger who was, uh, it was his New Year's resolution, he quit smoking and was quite uh, full of exuberance of the new life that, that led before him, and he, off he went jogging up behind Parliament Hill. And if you've ever been up to Parliament Hill, uh, aside from the stunning beauty, there's a parapets and and uh, the castle walls around the perimeter which uh, hug the cliff face. Well, wouldn't you know it, full of great zeal, he was up jumping from, from uh, wall to wall around the perimeter, and wouldn't you know it, he fell. And he, he went tumbling down the side of the cliff to sure and certain death that awaited him below, but he just managed in the last minute to grab hold of a tree root that was sticking out from the side of the cliff wall. Have you heard this story? Okay, so as he was hanging there by the side of the cri cri uh, cliff wall, he called out, help, help, is there anyone up there, help? And he heard a voice. And the voice said, it is me, God the God of your father and the God of his father before him, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Let go of thy tree root and all manner of things shall be well. All shall be well. Well, the man looked down and called up, Is there anybody else? The story is indeed a funny one, but it also reveals something about our human condition, about our fears, our attachments. If we could only let go and trust the one who has knit us together in our mother's womb, the one according to the Upanishads who says, to whom all words recoil, our belonging to God, this great holy other, is revealed again to us today in our beautiful scriptures. It's hard to talk about God, isn't it? You see, for the Christian, God is so other that we really have no language, no way to define God. St. Augustine even says in the Catechism, he says, Whatever you think about God, God is certainly not that. 
We have art, we have story, we have music, and we have beauty to try and talk about God, something that here at St. Matthew's you do very, very well. And yet we also say as Christians that God is as close to us that it is like trying to see your own eyeball. God isn't really the kind of thing we chat to our neighbors about at the end of our driveway or at the holiday party. In our secular society, God doesn't have a place at the table. In fact, respectable folk of of good taste need not bring up that old-fashioned idea after all. Other things in life seem somehow more real, don't they? More dependable. Like no matter how badly I want God to iron my shirts, nothing will do but a hot iron and my will. I mean, my identity comes from my hard work and success, doesn't it? My security is in my wise investments. I mean, I know everyone likes me. I always volunteer. I, I give the nicest gifts. I get invited to dinner parties. I have it pretty good. I'm even willing to go to church now and then for the nice music and friendly people, but I can't be expected to give it all up for, for God. But then who who can blame us, really? It is far more fashionable to dismiss the whole God business entirely. I mean, what has God done for me lately anyway? But what is it that we are so quick to dismiss? What is the meaning of this three-letter word we so easily throw around, faithful or unfaithful alike? David Bentley Hart says this, God is not only the ultimate reality that the intellect and will seek, but is also the primordial reality with which all of us are always engaged in every moment of existence and consciousness, apart from which we have no experience of anything whatsoever. Or again, to borrow the language of Augustine, God is not only superior sumo mio, beyond my utmost heights, but also interior intimo mio, more inward to me than my inmost depths. Hart says, only when one understands what such a claim means does not one know what the word God really means and whether it is reasonable to think that there is a reality to which that word refers and in which we should believe let alone let go of the tree root we cling to as we hang perilously off the cliff of our own existential existence. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. None of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all of your possessions. Well, the gospel will often comfort the disturbed. Today it seems to disturb the comfortable. Hate your family? Get rid of not some, but all of your possessions for God? Geez, what have I signed up for? It would seem, friends, that it is our possessions that claim us. Especially for us that have so much Am I aware of my need for God here in the most desirable place on earth to live, the highest quality of life ever known in the history of human beings, the life we share here in Canada, 
dare I say, right here in the glebe? Is Jesus asking me to give all that up for God? Well, I don't think Jesus is talking about just material possessions. What about the possessions of our successfulness, our power, the possession of esteem and affection, and the possession of security and control, all achieved by my own effort? Even our identification with group, our faith, our church, our tradition, even our own family, even the most lovable and good things, all created things, can claim us, bind us from an even greater freedom, the freedom that comes only from God. Well, I don't know about you, but I've sure had a great summer. And here we are at the end of summer, uh, Labor Day weekend, and I know many of our sisters and brothers are off in, at their cottages. Well, I thank you all for, for uh, uh, coming uh, today, and also my sisters and brothers here in the choir singing such glorious music. Well, one of the great things about uh, the summer, if you have the chance, is to sit by the fire. Has anyone sat by the fire this summer? Any campfires, anyone? Yeah, oh, I see a couple there. Well, staring into that hissing coals or the excitement of marshmallows and a good roaring blaze, nothing quite like it. But an interesting thing about sitting by the fire is also the discovery of how it imposes a limitation on your vision. You're only able to see a few yards away from the fire, aren't you, at night? The aperture of your pupils are closed from the strong light of the fire, and without the sun, and especially on a cloudy night, out beyond, say, ten feet of the fire's glow is darkness. Indeed, the fire is good and joyful, even a spiritual experience. But all of the infinite possibilities, the infinite mystery of creation, all that lies out there is eclipsed by the fire. That, friends, is what our possessions can do to us, even the good things, maybe even especially the good things. Jesus is not asking us to hate our families or to leave the church today naked with your keys at the door. But he is reminding us, albeit in strong terms, that there is only one true relationship, one source of being that illuminates and sustains your life, and that is the light of light itself that the darkness shall not overcome. And without life itself, what is the alternative? So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel as seemed good to him. And just like the clay in the potter's hand, so you are in my hand, O Israel says God. Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O St. Matthews, says God. Yield to me. Trust in me. Desire me most of all. Let go of what you cling to and let me shape you for what I have intended and created you to be. If you would just let go of the root we so fiercely cling to on the side of the cliff, we might discover that the potter has already given us wings.